Welcome to the ISO Show, dispelling myths and sharing tips for success to improve your business with ISO standards with your host, Mel Blackmore. Hello and welcome to the ISO Show. Well, we've been covering some information on ISO 27002, 2022, that was published this year, which are the best practice guidance on the 27001 controls. And uh, if you go back to episode 109, that's when we first started talking about, uh, about this particular subject, because it's something that a lot of people are starting to talk about right now. Businesses are looking to actually uh, review the controls in 27002 because they know that uh, ISO 27001, the new version of that standard, is on its way later on this year in 2022. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, so if you've been listening to the original podcast that we did introducing this particular topic, um, it does give you an overview on the new standard. Okay, so I'd recommend that you go back and listen to that. And over the last few episodes, I've been joined by Steve Mason, our information security expert here at Blackmores, who's been breaking down some information about the controls, in particular, the new controls and, and what to expect. So welcome back, Steve. Hi, Mel. Nice to be back. Great. Yeah. So this is actually going to be the last podcast in this series that we're going to be covering on 27002. So thanks very much for, uh, for joining us again. Just to, to recap then, so basically we did have you know, 114 controls in the old version and we've now got 93, I believe, is that right? I think that's about right, yes. And uh, what's happened is that uh, a large number have been combined from the old set of controls. So that's what's uh, caused the reduction because there was lots of duplication or lots of, let's say, unnecessary controls. In other words, it was breaking down bigger controls further and further, certainly around the access control. So that's what really what's happened. And then they've added 11 new controls to bring it up to the 93. So I did do some mathematics on it and uh, it all works out. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad you have. <laughs> but in summary, the 14 control groups that we did have have now been reduced to four themed sections and they include organizational people physical and technological and over the last few weeks what we've been doing is taking an example of one of the new controls from each of those areas so we covered off threat intelligence from which is 5.7 from organizational controls from technological controls we covered data masking 8.11 and also web filtering which is 8.23 so we thought we'd touch on one of the other groups which is physical controls and one of the new controls is physical security monitoring 7.4 so that's going to be the topic of conversation for today our interview with uh, with steve where he's going to be enlightening us with all things physical security monitoring but before we begin i mean you might be thinking well physical security is already in the standard but i think What's happened in the past is that this particular area has been overlooked in some respects because it's always been implied in previous iterations of 27001, but it's never been made explicit until now. So yeah, Steve, the, the new control is premises should be continuously monitored for unauthorised physical access. Could you just explain a little bit more about this new control then, please? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the real focus is to ensure that you've got systems in place to detect and det uh, unauthorized physical access. Now, all companies or most companies have had that sort of thing in place in the past, but uh, what's been overlooked is the actual monitoring. Sometimes people said, oh, it's, oh, we've got CCTV or we've got uh, access control doors and that sort of thing. We don't need to worry. Well, actually, if you start doing some monitoring on those parts, you begin to pick up perhaps trends of people trying to access your building or you know perhaps people walking around your building late at night or something like that which you've not been aware of it doesn't mean you've got to have somebody sitting in front of a, a monitor all day or sitting in front of a dashboard all day checking for physical security traits and things like that it just simply means you've got to have a system put in place 
that is able to bring out those uh, trends that might be happening in the day. Rather like your, all your other monitoring systems, they bring you alerts. They, they clear the sort of uh, white noise away and say, look, this is what you need to be worried about. So, Yeah, I mean, if, sorry, go on, Steve. I was only going to say that could be across things like access points, visitors coming in the building, uh, your CCTV, security alarms, man guarding uh, activities and uh, security patrols. I was just going to say, you know, if you have got all of these controls in place, and you might just have some of them, you know, you might not have a person uh, guarding the premises 24-7, but either way, if it's CCTV or, you know, you've got somebody on, on reception, all of these things are investments in your business. They all have a cost to the business. So it makes sense that these controls are as effective as possible that you know that you haven't just got somebody sitting there that yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can actually monitor some of the results yeah of uh, any you know unauthorized access and yeah just just to get an idea of you know who's coming and going uh, whether it's suppliers visitors and yeah so the, you've got you're better informed in terms of the level of risks to your organization yes i, I went to a bank once and uh, it was a very interesting uh, scenario there where they were monitoring uh, access to certainly secure areas in their business. And they'd uh, picked up this alert uh, that kept happening at five o'clock every night where somebody was trying to get into their most secure room in uh, the building. And it would uh, show up that uh, this person was trying to get in about three or four times over a 10 minute period. And they suddenly saw this trend building up. They wondered what was going on. And uh, they started asking questions. Nobody seemed to know what was going on. So somebody stayed behind late one night and uh, just watched what was going on. And it turned out to be the cleaner. It wasn't that the cleaner was swiping the card on the door. It's that the cleaner was walking past doing the hoovering. And because the access control was very sensitive, it was picking up her um, badge swinging as she did the hoovering. So it looked like somebody was trying to uh, access this room, but they weren't. But that's a very, very good example of monitoring these sorts of accesses and the, the trends that are happening and just going to find out what's causing it sort of thing. Now that was a very innocent case. There could be other cases that are not so innocent. I know an, an example of another innocent case. I can remember a company in London and the, they had cleaners that, that came in, but they also had another provider that came in to collect all the black bags and they just called them the black bag people. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, so they were yeah. the cleaners, they were coming in to, to do those collections and so Although they had controls like NDAs and other things like that in place with the cleaning company, there's nothing whatsoever with the people that were coming, you know, the company that was providing that service to come and collect all of the, the bags. And also, all of the rooms were left unlocked after they'd left as well. Uh -huh. So yes. again, yeah. it's, it's just about having complete transparency, isn't it, on the comings and goings 24-7 within your organisation. And you can't make an assumption that once you've locked the door at night, that nobody else is entering the premises until, you know, first person in, in the morning. There could be other activities that are going on that you're not actually aware of. So, and again, that was quite innocent, but it also meant that they were exposed because the office was, was left open for about four or five hours. Yes. When, you know, they had all of these, you know, really strict controls about, you know, closing the office at the end of the day. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing about this uh, physical security monitoring is that it's got so many routes to it. So if you take the CCTV, you've got to look at uh, how are you maintaining that CCTV to make sure it's giving you good images and also making sure it's got a date stamp on it and a, and a, a sort of time stamp that's accurate. If we think about visitors and access cards, how do we know the visitors have only got access to the areas they need to? So this uh, really would lead an organisation into doing perhaps a review of their access rights given on cards. Again, I'm a bit mischievous when I do audits because if somebody says to me, that's a secure room, only a few people are allowed in there, I will try and get in there. And it has worked in the past where I've either lent, <laughs> on, lent on a door and it's opened or I've actually used my access pass and it's got me into the room, much to the embarrassment of everybody around. But it's because there's been misunderstandings or the badge that I've had has been reprogrammed for some reason, sort of thing. So this is really what, what organisations need to be doing is before they start the monitoring, go back to the baseline and decide what it is you want for your security and make sure those baseline requirements are in place. Get that calibration right, you know, that configuration right for everything and then start to monitor from that point onwards. 
So you touched on a couple of areas then. So you mentioned about access points. So yes, yeah. we've got main building. Uh, obviously, we've got offices within the building and any other higher security rooms like, you know, server or a comms room then. So a couple of different angles there. And then obviously you've got visitors and suppliers, I guess, that are, you know, contractors that might be coming into the building. Very much so. And you, you might, uh, to save yourself a lot of time, you might sort of say, well, OK, if we've got contractor A coming in, they're going to have access to areas A, B and C. If we've got contractor B coming in, they've got area, uh, access to areas A, B and D sort of thing. So it's making sure that the access is right for the contractor coming in. But also be very, very careful. Again, this is where perhaps a, a kind of physical monitoring takes place, is making sure that the person who's turning up is actually who they say they are. I've come across that before where somebody turned up claiming to be from a telecoms company and they led him into the comms room and he actually wasn't from a telecoms company at all. He was actually from a customer doing a penetration test. And they soon found out about it from the penetration report that said... I bet they did. <laughs> yeah, you, you allowed uh, somebody who didn't have the authority to go into a comms room, uh, you allowed them in, sort of thing, and we've got the evidence of that sort of thing. So this is, the, this is the important thing, you know, people in reception are very important at this stage because they should be on the ball saying, OK, I wasn't expecting you to arrive, I need to do some checks before I allow you to have access so communication comes into this one quite a bit, making sure it's clear communication down to the people in reception. They are important people in your first line of defense of physical security. So don't overlook your reception staff. They, they can be very powerful in this, uh, this part of the standard. Yeah, and, and uh, if you've got these controls in place, I think we all take for granted, you know, that uh, if it was a, a person on reception, or, you know, a security person that they know what they're supposed to be doing because they may have done this before for numerous other companies. But it doesn't mean to say that they understand what your standards are for physical security controls and what you will be monitoring and measuring that they're actually doing. So yeah, communication is key, isn't it? Yeah. And also having proper inductions for sort of part-time receptionists coming in. Again, another organisation I walked into, they had a part-time holiday cover. She'd come in, she's a very pleasant young lady. And I said, I'm here to meet Mr. So-and-so. She said, oh, yes, he's on floor four, something. And I said, yeah, that's right. She said, OK, here's the pass. And I thought, mm, that's a bit unusual. I don't normally get a pass, sort of thing. Normally, I get met in reception. So I said, oh, can I go straight up? She said, oh, yeah, just make your way up. And of course, I walked upstairs and walked into the room where he was and stood next to his desk and said, I'm here, uh, with a complete shock for him because I shouldn't have done that. And I said, well, look. Yeah, I'm but he was horrified. Not to see right. you, Steve. No, but... no, that's right. Well, hopefully not. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he might have been. You never know. But it, it, was, it was just to prove that point that uh, they hadn't done the induction on this young lady coming in. And she thought she was doing the right thing. She's been very helpful. But actually, she was breaching their security requirements. Mm. So, um, so monitoring can be that physical activity that takes place, you know, uh, the first sort of meet and greet in an in organisation, right the way through to the monitoring that uh, becomes sort of results in a system somewhere, results on a dashboard. I think especially as in terms of the turnover and staff, and as you say, for temporary holiday cover, quite often that could be security or, or somebody on reception, you know, so, you know, potentially, I mean, would you suggest having I know you mentioned about having an induction, but there could actually be some kind of check sheet in front of them on the desk if they're new to the business. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, a ready reckoner card or something like that that just sort of says, look, if you get a visitor, uh, make sure they stay in reception until the person has collected them sort of thing. Uh, and that's just a very simple instruction. So things like that can easily be put out of sight uh, from the visitor coming in that the receptionist can read that's just under the shelf, perhaps, in front of her. Uh, or him and you know it gives them the instructions what they should and shouldn't be doing and what about organizations that will have buildings that house critical systems you know that might need continuously monitoring and how do you kind of differentiate that type of scenario when it comes to monitoring right well yeah i mean if we think about uh, data centers it might be that in many cases organizations are buying the data center services off of a, a third party so it's making sure that within your supplier contract, because there is a requirement for you to look at the security requirements in the supplier contract, is to ask those questions, saying, you know, what sort of monitoring do you do? Is it 24-7? 
and how do you get alerted to any physical security alerts and, and that sort of thing and how would you notify us so there, there's that side to it I, I do see organizations that have their own data areas in a data center and they have also got cameras in those areas with agreement from the data center people and so they can actually monitor things and then normally in their SOC they would have images of that data center showing so they could actually see people walking up and down the aisles so they're not actually looking at those uh, images on the screen 24 7 but they're there on on display in the SOC area and that uh, you know you might just glance up every now and again and see something but there should also be some sort of alert system in place that alerts you to some strange activities going on. So in terms of the installation of some of these devices, are you saying that it should be relevant to the, the commercial sensitivity or you know, the, the nature of the data, the, the assets that are housed in those areas? Uh, absolutely, yeah. It's, it's like all things within any of these standards, what's appropriate for your organisation? Because what might be appropriate for one organisation, which might just be a simple uh, meet and greet security uh, reception, might not be enough to another organization that needs to have uh, much more secure locks in place and uh, CCTV. So don't think that you've got to go out and buy a load of CCTV systems, you're going to have security alarms. If it's not appropriate for you, don't do it. Just do what's appropriate for your needs. Yeah, because you could really go to town on it, couldn't you, with you know, infrared technology, which could trigger alarms when an object passes through yeah. a particular area. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've been in sort of tier four data centers in some cases where they do have lots of security so not only do you have the signing in at the front desk and your pictures taken and everything like that but when you start going deeper and deeper into the data center it's asking for more and more information about you even down to your fingerprint and your sort of uh, retina scanning sort of thing so uh, and i wouldn't expect that to be in every organization it's not appropriate sort of thing so just, just look at what you've got you know, how secure do you need to keep your information? If it's all in the cloud and there's no sort of paperwork in your offices, maybe all you need is just uh, access control into your offices. And it's simple as that sort of thing. Because once you've gone home, there's nothing in your office for anybody to see. So there isn't anything in this new control that says that you must have CCTV or any of this, you know, technology. It's, it's all dependent on the organisation, you know, and the, the level of physical security must be proportionate to the business needs and, and the potential threats for that organisation in that environment. For the information and also take on board perhaps what uh, is in your customer contracts because your customer may, may turn around and say look we have an expectation that you should have a certain level of security in place well then uh, devise that you know uh, if that's appropriate for you. So it might be uh, it becomes cost prohibitive and it might then be a contract you decide you don't want to take on because of uh, those uh, prohibitions. So let's say you do have some of these assets, so you've got, you might have CCTV or some other monitoring systems in place. How do you look after those systems? What, because obviously there are certain risks associated with those assets, those security monitoring systems that you could be exposed to, you know, in terms of tampering with equipment or CCTV. So what are the sorts of things that we should be aware of there, Steve? Okay, if, if you're installing CCTV, uh, first thing is to have a look at the ICO guidelines on the use of CCTV, because there's some uh, strict rules, and certainly when it comes down to data protection on how you should use them. Uh, also think about the positioning of your CCTV. So if you're going to get an installer in, make sure they know what they're doing, and they're actually installing the cameras in a good place that's going to ensure that you get good images. Once you've got the cameras installed, you've got to then make sure that the system is connected to the main network so it's connected to let's say a timepiece sort of thing an ntp so that uh, it uh, then keeps the time and date correct because any images that come out of your cctv that have the wrong date or the wrong time on them may cause the data to be inadmissible in a court case other things you might want to be thinking about is um you know if you're monitoring your cameras take keep a log of which cameras go fail sort of thing because there may be a trend there so maybe the camera two is always failing but why is camera two failing and camera one three and five and four and five are not it could be the position in camera two it could be the camera two is uh, a friday afternoon build or something like that 
and uh, it's come out to you and it's always uh, failing. It could be that uh, camera two is susceptible to being tampered with. The other thing, uh, this is something I saw in Germany, which uh, I was very impressed with. On one site I went to, the Germans had actually produced for them uh, themselves a coverage map of their CCTV. So they drew their building, they drew where all the CCTV points were. They then coned out from each point the exact coverage of that camera. And that way they could actually find out where the blind spots were in their coverage. Now, that didn't mean they had to go and buy more cameras to cover those blind spots, but it did mean it, it informed the security guards to do more regular checks in those areas. That's quite a useful thing, yeah. And uh, since seeing that in Germany, I, I have actually passed that on to a few companies that I've visited in this country, you know, that uh, do you have coverage maps? And where they haven't got coverage maps, I've always encouraged them to think about doing it. And, uh, and most security guys that I've spoken to have actually seen the benefit of that uh, and have been very enthusiastic of putting that sort of thing in place. So uh, there, there's a benefit that could come out of this. So that can all come from your monitoring because you're doing your monitoring you may think that you're covering everything, but there are sort of uh, dead spots where people could take advantage. But it's making sure that whatever you've got in place, if, if your cameras are the sort of cameras that infrared triggered and that sort of thing, is that infrared technology still working sort of thing? Have you tested your cameras? So just check all that thing. So maintain the stuff to the highest standard you can. Great, thanks for that. And I think uh, it might be worthwhile just looking at how this particular control can cross over with other areas. So, you know, we've mentioned about access control, obviously, several times. We've also mentioned about inductions. And quite often, when a new member of staff or a temporary member of staff arrives, they get a, an access card. But in terms of monitoring measurement, this, this can tie in with just checking that the access controls that have been issued are the, are the correct ones that should be in use and that if you have had people that have left, have, you know, has that access card been disabled? So I think there's a few crossovers, isn't there, with a, a few areas. And another one, actually, that you mentioned the other day, one of the new controls, data masking. I guess, you know, could you take that into consideration if with visitors as well? You could, actually. That's an interesting one because that came up in conversation the other day where we were talking about data masking, talk to, talking about visitors books. And we were, I asked the client, so what sort of visitors book have you got? And they said, oh, it's just a, a register of people's names and everything like that. So I then said, so person B can see person A's name and their details. And they said, yes. So not only is that a potential breach of uh, GDPR, it's possibly where the data masking can come in. So uh, you need to think about your visitors books being masked in the sense that visitor A can't see visitor B and so on and so forth, you know. There are plenty of sort of visitor books out there that do this. There's loads of them on the market. The one I've seen that's actually working very, very effectively now is the use of an iPad. So the iPad's in reception. You type your name into the iPad. You type in the name and email of the person you're visiting. That means an email goes to the person in the organization that you're visiting. It takes reception a little bit out of the loop but it does give that sort of coverage of security because if the person that you've put in isn't expecting you, they might decide to just call security to reception as they walk out there, just in case there's a bit of a, a ruckus or something like that, you know, or they'll just be on their guard that, hold on a minute, I don't recognise this person, but I'll go and check anyway. Yeah, that, I've seen that working really well. I, I go to a, a regular meeting up at, in Cambridge in a building and uh, yeah, it's always iPad registration and uh, yeah, no, it works really well. You know, there's a photograph that's taken, it gets, and obviously the, the person you're visiting is notified and yeah, yeah, very good way. And you have to sign out in the same way as well. You do. Uh, although the funniest one I saw of that is where I had the image of the person prior to me put onto my badge. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so that's where your monitoring would come well, in well that's right <laughs> so obviously they had set the system up properly but it was just quite funny that uh, the picture of this young lady came out and uh, uh, it was against my name sort of thing so I had to walk around with this bag yeah. with this, uh, this young lady on <laughs> so, yeah. called Steve Mason right. <laughs> yeah uh, so uh, obviously we've talked about business premises but Many people now have got this hybrid working model and 
they are working from home. And obviously, when, when it comes to the scope of certification, we, we need to look at scope and boundaries. And for this particular control, it's focusing on business premises. But what advice would you give to those businesses that have got a lot of home workers and there are still risks associated with their physical surroundings and you know can they monitor and measure their physical security is it even possible yeah sure well there's lots of uh, answers to that one so let's start first of all with the boundaries of certification i think it's uh, well within an organization's right and uh, I, i've done this a few times for, for certifications and it's passed where they can say that uh, people's individual homes are actually out of scope in the sense that they're, they're beyond the scope of any assessment visit and that uh, security within an individual's home will be managed through policy and procedure. So that way you then have to make sure your policy and procedures are good and are fit for home working security and also that your staff are aware of those policies and procedures. So a good assessor would then say, OK, I'll interview half a dozen people and just ask them some pertinent questions around home security. What are they doing to protect information in the home? Now, an organisation cannot impose security requirements on an individual uh, unless there's perhaps a, a legal requirement to do so because they're working on uh, certain documentation or something like that. But you can't turn to somebody and say, look, you've got to have... Uh, a key coded lock on your door, front door, and everything like that, or you've got to have security alarms uh, fitted. So what do you do? Uh, you need to train people up to think about their surroundings and start thinking about the physical surroundings they work in. So if I was working, let's say, in the dining room downstairs, I'd need to be aware that I'm downstairs, I've got a window perhaps into the dining room. Can anybody look into that window? No, they can't unless they come in the garden. There might be other people in the house. What can those people see sort of thing? So just being aware of what's uh, around you and perhaps using some of the tools that uh, can protect the data. So if uh, let's say your children or your wife come in or your husband and you want to hide the information you're, you're working on, you could do Windows D and that minimizes everything you're working on. Or you can do Windows L to lock the screen. Very, very quick uh, keystrokes that keep the security going. Also think about uh, working from home again. If you're sitting in the garden on a nice day like this, sound travels. You could be on a phone call, you could be on a Teams call and your neighbours will hear everything on your phone call and your Teams call. Is that what you really want? Even here where I am now, I'm sitting here with a window open with my headphones on. They can only probably hear my side of the conversation, not your side of the conversation. So. Uh, it'll be a bit stilted to the conversation if anybody was standing out there listening. So um, hopefully my my voice isn't that loud that it's going to travel to the other side of the street or to the neighbours. <laughs> so, yeah, so your, your physical security monitoring really can't happen within the, the local home, but you've got to replace it with security awareness uh, and people being much more aware of their security boundaries within their homes, including that when it comes to the end of the day, your laptop goes away, it goes in a bag and it goes perhaps in a separate room or under the stairs or something like that where it can't then be uh, used by other people in the house. So that's all I can really advise on that one. Okay, now thanks for that, Steve. And I guess it does, you know, come down to, yeah, that, that home working policy and procedure, the do's and the don'ts, you know, do you allow people to print off information? Because obviously then that could be lying around as well. It's not just a laptop or... Absolutely, yes. Yeah, there are lots of different things out there to, to take into consideration for homeworking now. Yeah, and I have heard it said to me, um, <laughs> uh, I said to somebody, what, what do you do with uh, all the stuff you print at home? She said, I'll just throw it out with the normal rubbish. I said, but your policy is that you should be shredding it. Oh, that, uh, that policy doesn't apply when I'm working from home. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Um, you, you, get, you get a bit uh, lost for words when people come out with statements like that, you know. And, we um, can't argue yeah. against that. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's implied, isn't it, that, you know, sensitive data is shredded. But if it's not made explicit in terms of the homeworking, then it will be left to people's own interpretation. Yeah. The concept of risk, if, if they're not aware of, you know, what could actually happen if that, that documentation was found by the wrong people? You know, what, what damage could it do to your business? Absolutely. And I think this is one thing that the pandemic has, has done for us. It's made us rethink the way we do security, the way we think security. 
and uh, I, I've been seeing a sort of decrease in the amount of paperwork within the office now, and companies are becoming very paper light or paperless in that, that sense, where they wouldn't have even dreamt of it before. And when you're moving into this paperless and paper light uh, scenario, it means you've got less chance of printed documents being around at home. So all you're really then protecting is your laptop and making sure that the access to your laptop is, is controlled. And that could be improved, uh, again, the physical side through having good, strong passwords and also having uh, multi-factor or two-factor authentication in place just to uh, protect that access. So if the laptop does go walkies, you know that people aren't going to get into it without that uh, second code. So lots of things to think about. And this is where your security guys are going to, you know, help you out on this one. Okay, Steve, well, that is, has been a brilliant podcast. I think we've obviously covered a, a number of different areas on something that you would take for granted in terms of physical security monitoring. We've delved into a number of different areas and ways that it kind of crosses over with other controls within the standard. So, yeah, thank you very much for joining me today. That's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And hopefully we'll get, get you back on soon when the new version of 27001 is out. Excellent. Look forward to that. <laughs> right. So talking about the new standard ISO 27001, although it hasn't been published yet, um, you know, we are working with organisations to implement some of the new controls in 27002. And just to give you a bit of a heads up in what's to come when the standard does come out, um, we have got a migration programme in place. So this is a consultancy migration programme, which involves a one hour awareness video, which includes everything that's new, what to do in terms of what we need to update, what's the process for making the change and the timescales for implementation and certification. Once you've um, watched that, uh, we will then carry out a gap analysis and provide a clear action plan for implementation of the changes. And we can also provide support uh, to help with the implementation of those changes. And that could be anything from one to three days, depending on how you would like to you know, implement those controls and what you've currently got in place. And then finally, just to verify that all of the new controls have been updated, they've been implemented, and you've got the evidence to demonstrate compliance with the new version of 27001, we can carry out internal audits just on those new changes, which would generally be two to three days. So I just wanted to give you a bit of a heads up um, that we'll be offering that service when the new standard comes out. And also just to let you know that we're going to be putting updates into the ISOlogy Hub on a weekly basis over the coming months on those new controls in 27002. I did note that Steve mentioned about a free guide that was available when we were speaking with Steve earlier, which was the ICO CCTV guidance document. So I'll ask Steph, our communications manager, who uh, puts together the show notes after she's done the, uh, all the editing of the podcast, I'll ask her to put a link to that guidance in the show notes. And obviously, a summary of today's conversation will be included in there as well. So thanks very much for listening. And I look forward to catching up with you on the next episode of the ISO show. Looking to use ISO standards to drive better business practice? Contact us at blackmoorsuk.com to access further information and book your free 15-minute call.